welcome back to Metropole Sports Center. My name is Nashon Owano. And as I'd promised on the first part of the show, we are going to be talking matters sports development. And on the show today, I'm joined by Ashley, all the way from South Africa. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us on Metropole Sports Center. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having you on the show. Maybe you could uh, paint the picture for us. I mean, I know coronavirus has affected a lot of activities here in Kenya. I don't know how the situation is over there in South Africa. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, been time. Um, all sporting uh, teams, federations are under extreme pressure, mm -hmm. uh, financial pressure. Uh, just because so many elements of the revenue lines have been eroded, you know, fan, mm -hmm. is, um, fan attendance, new sponsorship deals, experiential uh, activations, all of that kind of work is, is switched off. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think we're going to see not only in South Africa and Africa, but globally, mm -hmm. the kind of pressure that uh, certainly soccer teams are going to face over the next 12 months. Okay. Uh, probably at the center of sports, I mean, forward zone, maybe you could, you could try to tell us about you, uh, what about for, forward zone? Because forward zone is at the center of sporting activities, mainly in, uh, in South Africa and in Africa generally. Maybe you could talk to us about what is forward zone and what is mainly about. Yeah, so um, I'm the founder of the business, a 20-year-old company, uh, uh, very active in, in the football landscape in South Africa and across uh, nine markets in Africa where we are intricately involved, teams, federations, sponsors, partners, um, and really I was playing in three different silos in, in the sporting industry, specifically football. One is in management. So looking and trying to help young top talent to develop themselves to become the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you ask most young uh, kids, what do you want to be one day, they'll mm -hmm. a professional footballer. Mm -hmm. um, because they watch that on TV and that, that's glamorous and that seems sexy. But to become that professional player, there's a particular journey you need to follow. Mm -hmm. So that's an area of our business where we specialize in what we call the talent development pathway, mm -hmm. managing that, mm -hmm. helping young players make on the way. Mm -hmm. Then we're very involved in what we call strategic consulting, mm -hmm. helping brands understand their value and their reason for being in sports. Mm -hmm. Certainly certain brands see sports as a very powerful tool within their marketing mix within their corporate social investment mix. Uh, sport presents a very particular emotional experience for so many. And that experience is, is, is a big part of, of why brands want to associate with sports. And that leads us to where we create experiential activations, mm -hmm. you know, experiences. You want fans to leave a stadium or a activity with a team and say, wow, that was special. I want to do that again. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we're an integrated agent. It's, uh, as I said, in a few different markets. Each of the markets have a different challenge. Mm -hmm. So it becomes super important to get a really good understanding of the local landscape, uh, understanding the local challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose if we looked across the Africa now, one of the big challenges that most of the leagues face is there's very little broadcast revenue in the leagues. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that, that's a big chunk of money that the clubs don't have to grow and develop and build. So we traditionally look for, you know, what to Mm -hmm. to help the teams improve and get better and be more efficient. I think one thing this COVID period taught us is that you've got to uh, manage money better, mm -hmm. can't overspend, very uh, on top of your detail in terms of how you run, manage, and mm -hmm. deliver a world-class experience for the fans through sport. Okay, so you've uh, you've mentioned a lot about you've mentioned a lot about the issue of uh, talent management, but uh, sometimes when you're talking about sports here in Kenya, there always seems to be a disconnect between 
talent and talent harnessing the talent that is there so you find there's usually that disconnect because sometimes when you're when you're walking around you find an individual who's really talented but doesn't get to a point where they're harnessed a hundred percent of their potential so what are you doing as a forward zone to ensure that you cater for that gap that exists in that particular area both uh, in, in 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 the markets that you're actually uh, catering for so, so I think I think it's important to kind of understand the journey, right? So, if young, talented player that you would see on the sides of the streets or in a dusty sandbar or somewhere uh, in Nairobi, in Accra, in Alexander, anywhere across the continent, mm -hmm. that player needs to go through what we call this talent development pathway. And that word development is super important, right? Because how do we develop this talent into a professional talent where they can earn a living mm -hmm. and a sustainable living and and development really has a few purposes that that we you know like to see in place so one is you need to have good facilities mm -hmm. you know good good players need to develop on good facilities so astro turf or grass or good pitches mm -hmm. yeah, certainly in soccer that's important equipment good balls good training kits um education so coaches you know, this young talent that has all the skill needs to be educated, guided, uh, and nurtured. And that comes from good coaches. Good coaches need to be educated. They need to be trained. They need to be well paid. So these kind of pillars of development for me are very important. So if we summarize them, facilities, equipment, and education, you know, those are three that will help this young talent make the journey or the step towards professional football. Mm -hmm. Young kids and players on the African continent to, to their counterparts, say in Europe, they had a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. The big clubs in Europe, they've got 14 beautiful grass fields and you know 20 or 30 coaches and the best equipment, and, you know, best scientific support. And you know, when you go compare apples with apples, you've got to compare the development process nurturing this tact as you talk about is a process that various components need to be aligned in order to unlock your true talent mm -hmm. and i think that that's the challenge we face on the unbelievable talent mm -hmm. which there certainly is mm -hmm. uh, again play on the biggest stages in europe uh, is challenging okay so i so know I this transition in talent is around this facility education okay i know i know this might be a very unfair comparison because if you look at uh, the leagues in england particularly the english premier league they seem to have uh, sort of understood how to turn the football activity into a full-fledged business the situation is however different in africa and other parts of the world uh, what do you think the relevant stakeholders need to do to change that narrative? Because you see most of the times, even here, I'll paint a picture for you here in Kenya, sports is usually looked upon as a leisure activity, you know. People never really look at it as, an, as, as a potential uh, employment opportunity. So how can the relevant stakeholders in the sports world uh, try or make efforts to ensure that they change that narrative, to ensure that business, the sporting activities are transformed into business ventures? Yes, I think that's a loaded question with layered answers. <laughs> I think... You know, if you look at the Premier League today, it's one of the, you know the biggest sporting businesses. That's how big it is. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a big reason for that is the broadcast right, global appeal. Mm -hmm. But each of these clubs, they run as businesses. Mm -hmm. They run with good people in good departments. They've got good structure. To say, looking across Africa, that's what has to change. Mm -hmm. Some of these clubs that are run by the chairman because he's got emotionally to build this dream of having a football club he may not have the skill and he brings and the auntie and all of these people try and run a family business through a football club because that's the dream mm -hmm. never going to work pulling mm -hmm. and sporting organizations they've got to be run and managed as businesses with the right leaders with strong governance with very strong structure mm -hmm. and also with professional people in key areas mm -hmm. digital marketing strategic marketing finance, admin, all of these things today require a very specific skill set. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes 
we find that these clubs want to run on a pals basis. Mm -hmm. So they've got a, a chairman's folly. He wants to own a club. He thinks it's cool to be a chairman of a football club, mm -hmm. but it can never transcend into something successful because there's a skill set missing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the, the transition that we have to face mm -hmm. to become business leaders in sports. Mm -hmm. We have to take off the social fun hat of leisure Mm -hmm. and, and move that dial from leisure to business. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we're going to see more success mm -hmm. because brands want to invest in successful leaders, successful structure. And I think that that's still the gap, certainly on the African continent, that needs to be closed. Mm -hmm. Better run, better managed, better business mm -hmm. acumen mm -hmm. in the world of football is certainly going to bring better sponsors and brands to the table. Okay, I think you've, you've mentioned on what the relevant stakeholders in terms of the administrative bodies can do to change that narrative. Uh, where does talent fit within this conversation? Because um, it's quite important because you know at the end of the day it's, it's something that goes all the way. Everybody within the sporting body has to pull their weight behind this whole narrative. So what is the role of talent at the center of this conversation of um, uh, transforming sports, sporting bodies or activities into uh, business ventures. So, so I think we should unpack the word talent a little bit, and mm -hmm. I think see it only as playing talent. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to be finding human capital talent mm -hmm. positions in the clubs. So, like I mentioned earlier, a really well-educated, very smart financial group as your CFO of your football club, mm -hmm. a highly educated, smart marketer to be head of marketing. I don't think that we must think outside of business mm -hmm. in the business of sport. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to build great business, we need the best human capital. Mm -hmm. So I think we should think of talent mm -hmm. as human capital talent mm -hmm. and playing talent. Mm -hmm. Because we can have the best players in the world in the team, but if the team's not well run and well or orchestrated, as on played on time and the taxes aren't correctly managed and filed mm -hmm. and the marketing structure isn't in place mm -hmm. then the talent can't go anywhere because the club can't sustain itself mm -hmm. and i think if you just look at some of the sporting organization they certainly in europe these are big businesses mm -hmm. you know turning seven eight hundred million pounds a year these are big corporations they can't be run on chairman's folly they can't be run with, with, with hash shakes. These are run as real businesses. So I think we've got to look at building talent on field mm -hmm. and off field talent. Mm -hmm. And I think the sooner we build and develop more off field talent, mm -hmm. the sooner we'll accelerate the growth and development generations and leagues mm -hmm. because you'll have the best people mm -hmm. wanting to be employed in those specific organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a couple of, uh, let, me, let me take you uh, back a bit. Uh, a couple of weeks back, we were talking about the imminent transfer of Lionel Messi away from Barcelona. And at the center of that, uh, when people are talking about Messi, there was the aspect of brand, the brand, the brand worth that Messi was either going to take to the new club or drive away from Barcelona. Uh, we can't really take away the importance of uh, branding in the sporting arena but uh looking at some of the athletes out here some of them have not really packaged themselves so based on your interaction and in your sphere of work i believe you have worked with uh, uh, numerous sporting individuals and sporting federations so what are the take-homes that individuals need to understand in terms of branding themselves to and to, to to probably attract sponsorship because you know at the end of the day when you're talking about business they have to make money for themselves you know so i think the the, the whole idea of branding has become such a wide area and i think a very specialized area i think with the the growth and development of, of certainly of digital marketing and the social platforms branding is such a key aspect so I think to unpack and to, to separate branding, you have the team brand, i.e. in the case of, of Lionel Messi Barcelona, mm -hmm. and then you have the Lionel Messi brand, the personal brand. Mm -hmm. And I think for, for me, the, the, the principle today is we buy with our eyes. You know, we spend so much time on the small little screen in our hands, i.e. our mobile phones. So we, we, we enjoy visual explosion. We, we enjoy what we see. Um, and as a result, 
the way a Lionel Messi perceives himself and the way he manages himself off the field by being clean living and you know single type relationships and never getting in too much trouble there was a little tax issue for a while but other than that he's been pretty clean living off the field so for me we always talk about in the personal branding space look after yourself mm-hmm. eat well sleep well uh stay away from substance abuse just keep it clean because mm-hmm. if you're going to keep it clean you, you, you're able to build a really good brand profile for yourself mm-hmm. and you can leverage and build that and we see that on the digital platforms today it's a global thing mm-hmm. i think from a team perspective mm-hmm. so much of success is interrelated and interwoven into great brand development mm-hmm. so as barcelona played this beautiful style of football and Pep Guardiola was was at his absolute peak at, at Barcelona and there was just a an array of talent and they were winning one trophy after the next the Barcelona brand became a marketing machine mm-hmm. so I think one's got to think about success and branding and marketing all kind of mixed together because I think the more success and the greater trophy cabinet you build the more you're able to build and develop a brand that people buy into you know, they feel it's authentic, they feel it's real, and they want to be associated with winners. Mm-hmm. And I think within that structure, then some of the players that are starting to really become icons like a Messi can build their personal brand, but parallel to and together with the Barcelona brand. Mm-hmm. So I think branding today is such a critical thing, the way we look, the way we speak, the way we dress, mm-hmm. uh, the way we talk, our tone, mm-hmm. our perception, our vibe, Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we talk a lot about this in, in training we do with what's called brand me. How do I walk into a room and play a room? Mm-hmm. What do I do that's memorable? How do I speak to people? Mm-hmm. How do I smile? What is my eye contact? Mm-hmm. These are the small touches and tips that help you really build your own personal brand mm-hmm. within a wider team framework. Okay. So maybe as we as we run down the interview, um, over here in Kenya, people uh, look at the league in South Africa in high regard. Actually, we have a couple of Kenyans playing over there. Maybe I know you in your course of work, you probably interacted with the people that are running the league in the in in South Africa. So probably based on your interaction with them, what do you think they are doing right? Because most leagues in Africa are actually really struggling a lot. Even sustaining a, a league for the whole season is usually a challenge. So what do you think is it that they're doing right over there? So I think what South Africa has done right is that they've built a very, very strong structure. Mm-hmm. The league's well run, well operated, good leadership, um, lasting leadership. Dr. Corzo has been leading the league, has, has done an incredible job to build and, and develop the product. Because I think that's what it is. Football is a product. And ultimately, the key piece of the product needs to lie in TV. And ultimately, the broadcast revenue across the world is what it sustains a lot of leagues. There's no question. Mm-hmm. If you peel away the business model, broadcast revenue is, is very strong. So the South African League has been very strong in building its broadcast partners. Now with, with, with Super Sports and certainly some pay TV. Um, and now with the strengthening of a new partner in the naming rights of the league strengthening and educating the the league itself the development of the multi-choice disky league Mm -hmm. to help and develop the younger players so i think one of the key pieces would for me would be structure Mm -hmm. because i think as the structure got better brands had more comfort and got involved with that structure you know the big brands want to be involved in something that's structured organized Mm -hmm. good audited financial statements governance these pieces Mm -hmm. and i think that those are the reasons for attracting the various brand partners so the league partner the cup competitions uh, the development structures education these are all the elements mm-hmm. that allow for a very strong sustainable league and mm-hmm. i think that that's what's important because if you look you know take a snapshot over say the last eight to ten years in africa kenya had a broadcast partner uganda had a broadcast partner ghana had a broadcast partner now a lot of those deals as they changed they're very different they're not getting the same value. The teams aren't getting the same value. And I think there's this tension that develops between the federations or the leagues and the teams because there isn't the same kind of revenue. You know, that broadcast revenue, it oils the cogs. It allows the engine parts to move faster. And I think that that's something the leagues have to get better at, is get better structured, better organized, good leadership to attract the right kind of partners to be able to grow the game from grassroots to glory. 
Okay. So probably the last question. Um, over here in Kenya, I'm recently interacting with um, people who are running sports management companies or some that are actually coming up. Maybe in like, in like two minutes, what, what would you like tell them? Like what, what are the key things that they need to look into as they continue to uh, get into the world of sports management? So, so firstly, for me, I would say focus. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to pick a lane, pick a sport and just get into that sport, get into the weeds of the sport, understand it from grassroots all the way to the top. So mm -hmm. pick a sport, focus. That, that for me would be number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, pick an area. You know, there are so many areas in sports. There's grassroots development. There's team management. Mm -hmm. There's digital asset management. There's talent management. There's eventing. There's various different let's call them components that make up the sporting industry and disciplines. And I think, again, that leads to focus. So focus on a sport, then focus on an area in that sport. I think also today, women's sport development needs to be top of agenda. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big opportunity in developing and helping and growing women's sports mm -hmm. parallel in, in all the codes. Mm -hmm. So in certain markets, football, in certain the markets, basketball, in certain of the markets, rugby or touch rugby or cricket, you know, the, the sports are growing. Um, women's sports is certainly growing a growth trajectory across the globe, mm -hmm. second to none. Um, so I, my encouragement to the to, to young uh, or, or, or startup businesses in the sports management business, focus, pick a sport, then pick a particular discipline mm -hmm. and really stick to that and be patient. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have patience. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't build a, an enduring business or a successful business overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to make a few mistakes. I think sometimes the toughest losses teach us the most things. Mm -hmm. So, so just, uh, you know, be headstrong. If mm -hmm. you make a few errors, learn from them, grow from them. We always talk about failing forward. You know, sometimes in life you're going to make a few errors because you tried something, but, you know, pick yourself up and keep going. So the encouragement is, is, is to be focused pick a particular area and be really resilient and be hardworking. You know, there's, there's no substitute for hard work. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately those pieces together can be a recipe for success. Okay. Thank you so much, Ashley, for joining us on Metropole Sports Center. Now, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Now, that was uh, Ashley all the way from South Africa, the CEO of Forward Zone, which is a sports management all the way in South Africa. We're just talking about contextualizing the whole conversation about uh, the narrative, changing the narrative probably from looking at sports as a, as a possible uh, employment creator. Now we take a short commercial break. After the break, I'll be briefing you guys on some of the events that you need to watch out for this coming weekend. See you after the break.